So, my name is Leonard. Don't bother about my last name. Um, uh, if somebody asks me how to pronounce it, I get self-conscious and then I mispronounce it, so. <laughs> I'm born in Sweden, but I live in Poland with my uh, wife, daughter, two cats, and way too many fruit trees. Uh, I've been using Python since Python 152, and I've been working with Python and web since 2001. I wrote the book on how to move from Python 2 to Python 3. You can find it in HTML and PDF on python3porting.com. It's open source on GitHub. And I work for Brightcore. Uh, Brightcore, we're doing the type of software that insurance companies use to deal with insurance policies and claims. So it's not fairly uh, interesting unless you are in the insurance industry. We work completely remotely, and yes, we are hiring, so if you want a job and you are looking for remote work, you can talk to me. Uh, I'm new to the whole recruiting bit. I've never done this before, but talk to me anyway. We are not on Python 3 yet. We have just started. It's an ongoing effort. But uh, at my last job, um, uh, called Shoebox, which is also a very nice company and which most likely are also looking for people. Uh, although um, I should warn you that the system there is insanely complex. Um, we successfully moved this large and insanely complex system to Python 3 last year. So let's step back in time, back to the Stone Age. Um, when um, you or somebody at your current job made some sort of application in Python. And this is you, back in the Stone Age, with your web framework. Yeah. Um, and whoever did this, you or the other person at your job, made such a good job that this application is still running. It's probably a web app, it's probably some old version of TurboGears, Web2Pi, or maybe even Zoop. And you have for years now been bravely running away from Python 3. But you can't run any longer because Python 3 is committing suicide. Um, but don't be afraid of Python 3. A lot of people are afraid of it and think it's horrible and bad and everything, but it's not, it's not the killer rabbit of Kerbanog. It's just a regular old Python. So. Now, the hard part of porting to Python 3 is getting your system into a state where it's easy to port. And this is something that is a benefit for you anyway to do this, to, to fix up your system. Uh, the porting itself is quite easy. It's what comes first that is hard. And that uh, first step of that is to stop being a fire department because many large organizations are constantly just putting out fires in their applications. Um, and that's not a good situation to port to Python 3 because if the changes that you are making to your system uh, as a part of normal developer uh, development keeps breaking it and turning into problems and you have to fix them in panics, um, then moving to Python 3 is going to create several of these fires and that's going to be a big problem. Also, if you are in constant firefighting mode, you don't have time to move to Python 3. So you have to first get development to be normal and calm and regular. So you have to get out of firefighting mode. Now, how to do that is in itself a whole talk or maybe a whole conference. Uh, and I was, would not be the person to do that anyway because I'm not a DevOps guy. Uh, I'll just mention some things that I've seen being done to fix this situation. And this slide here assumes that your software is a service of some sort, a web app or some other service, and that you have like a production environment that you need to keep up. Uh, because that's the firefighting that I've seen and that I know, and I don't even know if you can have firefighting if you have some other sort of application. But if you do have firefighting in another sort of situation, then come talk to me because I have, I'm interested in hearing why you have firefights in that situation. Why you're firefighting. 
So to port to Python 3, you need to have tests because otherwise you don't know if it's going to work on a Python 3. Um, and, but tests also help with stability. So if you are firefighting and there is a problem, make sure you have a test to make sure that never happens again. Always add tests. Uh, and you have to run those tests, and that means that for any sizable project you need to have continuous integration. If you have a production situation, if you have a production server, you also need staging servers to test things on. Um, you should have automatic deployment. Deploying the latest release or just making the latest release from master or from a, 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 a production branch uh, should just be pushing a button. You shouldn't need to do anything more and everything else should be automatic. Extra points if this is done automatically every night to a staging server so you know that your uh, release uh, procedures actually work. And monitoring, of course, as the previous talker said, speaker said, uh, you should know if there's a problem before your users know it. And there are some Python specific things you can do too, uh, like uh, you should run in an isolated production environment. And that means a build out or a virtual env and maybe some sort of containers. Containers are very in now and have been for several years. And that helps so you don't get weird interactions with operating systems. Like for example, Docker. And mo for most of you, this what I'm gonna say now, it's probably obvious, but I just only realized it the last few months when I work at Brightcore. So I'm gonna mention it because it's new to me. If you use Docker on production, uh, you quite often have to rebuild the Docker images. For example, every time you have new requirements, you rebuild the Docker images because a part of the images is the virtual env that you install and you install all the packages. And if you do that and some new requirement creates a conflict uh, when installing, you get that error when building the document images, not when pushing to production. And that's a really good thing. Um, because your deployment done doesn't mess up production because it breaks when you're building the images. In addition, you can then use those images on continuous integration and maybe even develop on them so that your developers have exactly the same environment as production. So that's really nice and it's like, oh wow, I, now I understand why everybody's talking about Docker. I, it took me years. So. With all these things in place, your firefighters can take it easy and you can go on to preparing. Or you can go on to planning, which I'm going to talk about later. Or you can do both at the same time. So there's two stages here, preparing and planning, and they are independent. You can do both at any time. And the first preparing is that you should pin all your versions of all your packages, every requirement that you have. And if you don't know what pin means, it means that in your requirements file you ex specify exactly which version. Not uh, at least this version or less than version, exactly which version um, should be pinned. Um, and unfortunately I have not find, found a way to require this in pip, to tell pip that everything has to have a pinned version. Um, so one day way you can do this is to verify in the install script or if you have Docker in the build images that what you installed um, by getting a pip freeze, you get a list of exactly what you installed and compare that to your requirements file so that you don't have installed something that's not in the requirements file, for example. Another way to do it is to add hashes to the requirement file. Then you're specifying not just which version, but which exact package to install. So you install a specific wheel or a specific egg or something. And you can have several hashes for each version, so you can say all these are okay. Um, this has the benefit that as soon as you specify one hash, uh, pip will refuse to install anything that doesn't have a hash. Uh, so that way you know that you are getting exactly what you want when you're installing it. it it's extra maintenance, extra work to get all these hashes in, but it also means that if somebody uploads a malicious package to uh, 
uh, to this cheese shop, uh, you won't download that by, by mistake. You know exactly what you're installing. So one of those versions, make sure that you know exactly what you have when you're installing. You might also, as a preparing, want to increase the test coverage even more um, because it's very good to have a line coverage when porting to Python 3 so there's no hidden Python 2 statements somewhere that you missed in the porting. What percentage of test coverage you want is really a matter of opinion. 100% is obviously awesome, but for a big project that's generally unobtainable. 90 to 95% maybe seems reasonable. And you can bridge the gap by reading all the lines that are non-covered by actually having um, before every big release, uh, or at least before you're trying to do the last big pushes that you actually check all the code and you just read it manually because at some point that gets easier than writing a test for them. When testing there's one big thing that you might uh, encounter and there's this philosophy when it comes to unit testing that you should test each function separately. You should have one test for one function and every call from that function out to other functions should be mocked. Um, but if you do that, you only test the that the function is doing what you tell it to do. You don't actually test that it works. Um, and if the API calls then changes, the test will still pass. And this is a huge problem with Python 3, obviously, um, because the standard library changes. So this type of testing is practically useless when porting to Python 3. So if you are doing this in your use unit tests, if you have this principle and follow that to mock out all the calls from a, from a function when you test it, uh, then you need to have 95% coverage from your integration tests. Your unit tests you can basically uh, ignore. After this, you need to upgrade your dependencies. You have to make sure that the latest Python 2 compatible version uh, is what you're using of all your dependencies. And after you have done that, you have to make sure that all of the dependencies you have are also Python 3 compatible. And you may have to replace or in worst case port uh, those dependencies. But since those are separate packages, this, that's generally relatively easy to do unless the package is highly magical but by today most highly magical popular packages already support Python 3 and if they don't like for example Python MySQL there are forks of them that people are moving over to that do support Python 3. So this stage can take a significant time especially if you not have not been keeping your dependencies up to date. I have met people and talked to people here that are still running on like Python 2.6 because they actually can't upgrade to Python 2.7 and stuff like this. So if you're in that situation, expect this to take time. And then you come to stage three, planning, or you already did it. Um, and planning here is a lot about how many people in your team should do the porting? Should all of them be involved? And um, should you move to Python 3 directly or should you have Python 2 and Python 3 compatible code for a while? And there's three questions there I have for you. The first is, can you stop adding features, stop adding features and stop firefighting? And for how long can you do that? Because porting will, in best case, take two weeks and in worst case even if you do everything at one go it can still take months. Um, can you stop adding features and stop firefighting that long? Do you have some deep magic that only a few of your developers understand? Because that deep magic has a big risk that it's difficult to port to Python 3 and that bit will then block everything else. 
And how big is your team? If you have 50 people, you can't put all of them on porting to Python 3. That's just a logistical nightmare. The mythical man month remains mythical even with Python 3. So um, you can put 10 people on doing this, maybe more. 20, I think, is stretching it. Unless you're very good in your organization at putting a lot of people on doing one thing. Um, and if your system is already split up to multiple separate services, then you can put one team on each of these services, so then you can easily put five or ten people on each service, so then you're way ahead of the game. But most of these old systems are monoliths. So some different strategies here then is to do it all in one go. And you don't have deep magic, you can stop adding features for a month, maybe. Why not do it all in one go? Well, it takes less time to do it. It's less work in total, um, a little bit, but not a lot less work, but a little bit. And you can aim directly for Python 3 code, which is a benefit and speed things up. But there's a high risk of doing this. If you start doing this, you put all your seven developers on porting to Python 3 for two weeks and then you discover that there's some huge issue that means you kind of have to stop right now. Well, then you go back to adding features and adding and fixing bugs and your two branches are going to start to diverge. And there's a risk that when you start half a year later with Python 3 again, that you basically have to throw away all the work that you did during those two weeks. So it's a very high risk strategy of doing it. And of course, all other work has to stop. So slow and steady is a safer strategy. And this means that you aim to write code that will run under Python 2 and Python 3 at the same time. Uh, although you run it on Python 2 in production until everything works under Python 3, and then you can switch. This is the low-risk version. It doesn't disrupt normal operations. <clears throat> it's a little bit more work, and more importantly, it takes longer time, uh, because you're going to still do all your other work at the same time, so Python 3 gets pushed a little bit to the side, and it can take half a year to get through all of this, because not everybody's working on it. And of course, you need dual version support, which means it takes a little, a little, bit, little bit more work. What you can do if you have a development team that is small enough to fit into one big house, you can start with a Python 3 sprint for all the developers, but not aim for Python 3, but aim for Python 2 and Python 3 compatible code, so it runs on both. Uh, that way, when you come back half done, you can switch to having a dedicated team to do the last bit or just do it as a background task when you don't have anything that is really, really critical. And this is what we did at Chewbox. Uh, we rented a house in southern Spain during the winter when there's low season, so it was cheap. Got all the guys, almost all the developers, in there and we tried to move to Python 3 for a week. And we got almost the whole way there. Uh, it was, we, we got a fair bit done. Uh, so of course we weren't done, but you know, we had solved most of the critical issues. S and it's a lot of fun to get everybody into one room and just hack away on something. So this is low risk because you're aiming for Python 2 and Python 3 compatible code. It only disrupts your normal operation briefly for a week or two, or however much you want to take. And everybody gets on board and feels involved, which is good. It's not just one or two guys in a corner sitting porting to Python 3 where everybody else just sits and go, oh, Python 3, uh, Python 2, that was good. We shouldn't have, and stuff like that. So everybody gets involved, so it's good. The drawback is that you do still need dual version support. It's still fairly slow, although not as slow as just the really slow version. Then you come to the actual porting stage, and there are several things you need to do here. You will not start to run your tests under Python 3 here. This will obviously fail. 
and that's okay. But your continuous integration uh, system still needs to run it under Python 3 and make sure that as much as possible runs under Python 3 uh, because otherwise people will add back uh, incompatible code. And if you have some people trying to port to Python 3 while other people are adding Python 2 code, you're going to backslide and you're never ever going to get done. The trick to stopping this is continuous integration. But of course, you cannot just let your continuous integration say, no, this failed because it doesn't work on Python 3. Because in the beginning, basically all tests will fail. Or in fact, it probably won't even be able to find the tests in the beginning. So what you need to do is get your CI gurus, the people who knows your continuous integration system well, to set it up to keep track of which functions, which tests that once passed under Python 3. And if they passed under Python 3, then the CI run should fail if that test no longer runs under Python 3. In that way, every time you change something and some tests stop working under Python 3, you're going to have to fix that. And sometimes that means that you make a small little change. It's like it's a bit a little change, you can just fix a little bug and suddenly lots of things that used to work under Python 3 no longer work under Python 3. And then you have to spend a whole day fixing all this. Sometimes it's the tests that need fixing. It's really boring work, but these things happen and you have to do that to stop this backsliding. Uh, we turned it off briefly for a firefighting thingy at Chewbox and forgot to turn it back on for a month or two and there was loads of incompatible code added during this time, even though everybody knew they shouldn't do it. It just happens by mistake. And you basically have to go on and fix a lot of issues that you already fixed once again. So that's really annoying. So have this. Stop the backsliding. I'm sure you know what 2 to 3 is already. Uh, it's this tool that will convert Python 2 code to Python 3 code. What's really helpful here is to use modernize. Modernize is a set of extensions to 2 to 3 that uh, will convert from Python 2 code to code that is compatible with both Python 2 and Python 3. And it does this by using the 6 compatibility layer. Um, there's another compatibility layer called Python Future. It also has its own 2 to 3 extensions. Uh, but Python Future inserts a lot of magic primarily into Python 2 to make it look more like Python 3. And this magic has bitten me several times. So my recommendation is to not use Python Future, but to rely on Python Modernize. And as I mentioned, the first errors you will get are errors to, that actually prevent you from even finding the tests to run. The test runner will, won't find anything because you will just get import errors everywhere. And behind those import errors, there's usually either other import errors or syntax errors. So you're going to have to fix that. And the way to fixing that, especially in the beginning, is to figure out what is wrong, find one of these Python modernize or two to three fixers that will fix that specific wrongness and then run it. Uh, maybe even just on that file where you had a problem. Because if you start with just going, oh, I'm just going to run Python modernize on everything and then go on from there, then when you find errors, those errors may be in lines that already have been changed. And then you don't know if that error was really there from the start or if it's an error that was introduced when running the fixers. So therefore, in the beginning, you need to do this slowly and carefully, one fixer at a time, maybe even on one file at a time, just to fix that file. And then you run the tests again, and the import error you get is in some other location. So then, good, then you fix that, and then you go on to the next import error. Um, you could, of course, just, once you find the error, you go, oh, I know what to do here. And this is an easy way, easy thing to fix. And it's tempting to just change the code, save it, and run the 
thing again. But the problem is the next error you will get three lines down is the same thing again. And doing that gets quickly very boring. So use these fixers to run on uh, files so it doesn't get so boring because it will fix several places at one time. But do one fixer at a time. And then you just fix, 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 fix. And this is where the book is finally useful because the book is about finding how to fix these errors. Um, and as you get more confident, you can start running those fixers on like maybe a whole directory at a time and things like this because you're starting to get a better feel for what is happening. Uh, but if you run it on a lot of files at once and you're several people doing this, you're going to get merge conflicts. So this is why it's good to do it one file at a time if you're many. Don't forget that you have scripts in your development environment. Usually you have some sort of helper scripts to create test data, to copy databases from production, so you can test on real data locally, these kind of things. Loads of these little helper scripts. They're going to have to be ported too. If they run in a separate virtual environment, you can actually do that first as practice. as a good thing to get up and running on, on porting. If they run in the same environment, same virtual environment as your main application, that's usually because they import that application to do things and then you're going to have to port them last. But don't forget that these also have to be ported and the sooner the better basically. You also need to write data migration tests. You have to take the data that you have that is generated under Python 2 and make sure that you can still load it uh, under Python 3 and that you get the right thing. That you get Unicode when you expect Unicode, that the encodings are still correct. Um, basically, anytime you're loading, loading data from a database or disk, you need to have a test there. And if it doesn't work, you need to write migration scripts. And if you're using pickles, well, I'm sorry. Uh, you're in deep shit. <laughs> so once all tests pass, or maybe even before, you try to push Python 3 to staging. Try to run this under, under, on the staging under Python 3. This is uh, going to fail the first few times, and that's OK. And then once everything seems to work, test it properly on staging with production data that everything seems to work fine, click through everything, be thorough. And once that also works, you push it to production. Or if you don't have a production, then you make a release. Um, if you have production and you can actually move like one customer at a time to Python 3, do that. Take it slow and careful if possible. If you need to migrate the database to get onto Python 3, uh, try starting everything read only so you know that it at least works in that situation first before you enable editing. Um, if you can fall back to Python 2, be prepared to fall back to Python 2 if there's an error. And then when you have it on production, I've had, had it for a few weeks or so, you party. You're done, you got it on Python 3. And after party, you have to clean up, and that's not so fun. But once you cleaned up after the party, you have to clean up the code. And that is a lot of fun. <clears throat> now you can get rid of all those Python 2 incomp uh, backwards compatibility things. Um, and that feels very satisfying. This is a really nice part of the project, getting rid of all the old craft. Um, see this as an opportunity to just prettify your code in general, just go through it, fix it up, remove anything old and ugly, uh, pep, if, pep aid it, um, maybe run it through black to get everything formatted exactly as it should be and things like this. Um, make your code feel new and shiny again. It doesn't take very long to do this, actually, because you have to go through the code to remove the old Python 2 backwards compatibility things anyway, 
prettifying and cleaning up the code in general is basically you get that for free. And in general, even with a big system, this just takes a few days. So do it, it feels really nice. And then, done. You're up on Python 3, the code doesn't even run on Python 2 anymore, everything is fine and finished and you have all the new features of Python 3 and you can start using them. So in summary, stop firefighting, prepare and plan in whatever order you want, fix the tests under Python 3, push to staging, production, and then clean up. That's the general plan. Any questions? going to uh, 2 plus 3 compatibility and support also for long term because we are talking about people who will still be using Python 2 in years to come. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have another big project related to the first one uh, and we are, after the experience with this, we, we were thinking of going straight away to Python 3 drop support for Python 2. Now I got from your talk that maybe this could have been um, uh, uh, the result of using Futurize because exactly what we got is we spent so much time fixing the Python 2 part. Af after migrating to 2 plus 3, the three, uh, the 3 was working well, the 2 was suddenly broken everywhere. Yeah. So is this, would you recommend if someone has to still support 2 and 3? To, to really, I mean, is, is it futurized versus modernize and six? Yeah, I, re I recommend modernize and six then if you need to run on both Python 2 and Python 3. Um, yes, I mean, if you're already using futurize, and we have both on Brightcore and on, on uh, Shoebox, in the list of our requirements, we, futurize is there because it's being used by other packages that we are using. So. People are using it successfully, so if you are using it successfully and it's, it's working, then that, that's fine. Um, but but uh, if you're not already using Futurize, I would uh, recommend against it, because I think it's more trouble than it's worth. Anything else? All right, uh, yeah, uh, come and talk to me about your experience in trying to move to Python 3. That's interesting, too. So, thank you.